We are continuing this morning our series called Encounters, Never the Same. And we're looking at the different encounters that Jesus had with people after his resurrection. After he rose from the dead on the third day, for about 40 days, he began to appear to people all throughout Jerusalem, revealing that he was in fact alive, that he was not dead, but he was raised from the dead. And with every encounter, the people that he encountered were never the same. Because they realized, man, he really was alive. Man, he really is the son of God. And everything he said is true. And it left them never the same. And we're going to take a look at one of these encounters here in John chapter 20. If you have your Bibles, I welcome you to turn there with me. If not, it will be up on screen for you. And I'm at that place in life where I need a Bible with bigger words because I can't see it. So I might do this. And uh, if, if so, you understand why. Amen. All right. Uh, John chapter 20, starting in verse 19. It says, On the evening of the first day of the week... When the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Amen. The title of our message this morning is The Cure for Fear. The Cure for Fear. As we saw in this text that we just read, the disciples, after Jesus' brutal crucifixion and was buried in that tomb, they were locked in a room for fear of the Jewish leaders. And you can understand why. I mean, they're best friend for many of them, Jesus, their teacher, their mentor, the one whom they believed was the Messiah who would deliver them from Jewish oppression, oppression was just brutally beaten and tortured and murdered at the hands of the people he was supposed to deliver them from. And many of them watched from afar this whole thing play out, probably in sorrow and terror and grief like many of us have never experienced. Some of them witnessed it from up close at the foot of the cross, watching him suffer and die and bleed to death. And you can imagine the type of trauma that caused them. And they found themselves in fear that the very same people that did this to Jesus are now going to come after us, which was a reasonable fear because they were. And so they locked themselves in this room because of fear of what might happen and because of what had just happened. And you know what? In life, there's a lot of things that can cause fear. Have you noticed? I mean, we could spend all day just listing the things that can cause us fear, and we would all get super depressed. But there's no limit to things that can cause us fear. I mean, just in our own personal lives. You ever open up your bank account and notice there's a lot less in there than you thought was going to be in there? Right? Fear. Or you get your tax bill and you realize you got to pay more than you thought? Oh, my God. Fear. Or you just realize that you need to pay your taxes and it's due tomorrow? <laughs> fear right <laughs> or you're afraid of that diagnosis that you might get or the diagnosis that you got and it's causing fear or you think about your children and how are they going to live and grow up and buy a house and and make it in this world today and that causes you fear or maybe it's something that you saw in the news like the recent escalation in the war in Israel yesterday that began to take place and that's causing fear of what might happen is this going to turn into World War III and it's causing fear I mean there's no limit to the things in this life that can cause us fear but if we're not careful if we don't do something about it our fears can be debilitating it can control us to the place where we find ourselves locked away and not able to do what God's called us to do because fear has a grip on us that's what we see happening to the disciples here and there are so many fears, right? The fear of commitment for many of us, which keeps us from getting into relationships. The fear of the future, which keeps us away from taking risks and doing things that we know we're supposed to do. Fear of losing a loved one that can cause us to be maybe a little too controlling in different ways. Or the fear of death, which we know is coming for every single one of us. How do we live with faith in the midst of innumerable amount of things that can cause us fear? Well, again, like I said, if we're not careful, fear can control us and limit us. I want to share with you just some statistics on fear because I, I like statistics. I'm kind of a nerd like that. But according to the Centers of Disease Control, 27.3% <clears throat> of U.S. adults 18 and over have what they call an anxiety disorder. And what an anxiety disorder is when fear begins to control us. Fear is normal. We all get afraid of stuff. But when it begins to control us and change the way that we live and limit us, it becomes an anxiety disorder. 27.3% of American adults, many of us in this room, 
most likely, just statistically speaking, have some form of an anxiety disorder where fear is taking grip. 41.7% of young adults ages 18 to 29 have what they call an anxiety disorder. That's a lot of young people that are dealing with anxiety. But even more troubling, look at this, 70% of high school teens see anxiety and depression as a major problem in their lives, according to a recent Pew study. A major problem. 70% of teenagers find anxiety and depression a major problem in their life. That means fear is gripping our young people. What do we do? How do we help them? But it's not just that. 32% of college students were diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder as well. So fear can be debilitating if not dealt with. If we don't find a way to live with fear and mitigate the fear and turn it into faith, it can control and destroy our lives. There's consequences in our mental health. Like I said, anxiety disorders, depression, post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, there's so many mental health things that come out of that. But it also affects our physical health. All the way up to things like premature coronary artery disease, heart attack, stroke, cancer can be linked to lingering anxiety and stress in our lives that goes undealt with. So what do we do? How do we manage this? How do we deal with this? Dealing with fear is a big deal. So what do we do? I love what this text teaches us. I don't want to unpack several truths that I hope will help us today as we deal with the different fears in our lives. First is this, in your notes and on screen, the disappointments of life can cause us to live with fear. It's often the disappointments, the unmet expectations, the way things have gone that don't line up with what we had hoped or what we had wanted can cause us to live with fear. That's what happened with the disciples. They had expected that Jesus was going to be the Messiah to deliver them from the Romans. Instead, he was murdered by the Romans and they were disappointed. And it caused them to live with fear. They experienced trauma in witnessing him be brutalized and murdered, which caused them to live with fear. And our fears often develop through the traumatic experiences that we face in life. Did you know that studies suggest that there, we're only born with two innate fears? Did you know that? Just two. And, uh, you know, you want to guess which ones they are? Um, there'd be too many, there's too many of us. It would take forever to do that. But I'll tell you what they are. The t- two things that we're born with that scientists tell us is the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Right? It's the fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. That God hard- hardwired that into us, I guess, so we don't fall over. <laughs> or, and, and loud noises because... I guess that signals danger. I don't know. But either way, if you think about it, if we're only born with two innate fears, a fear of falling, fear of loud noises, all the rest of the fears that we've accumulated in life, we've learned somewhere. And it came from some experience that we had that now caused the fear to be rooted in our heart, right? You know that that, that phrase, new fear unlocked, right? That comes from some experience that happened to us that now leads to a new fear in our lives. Again, traumatic experiences, disappointments, world events, And again, if we're not careful, those things can control us, cause us to be locked away and live far below God's purpose and plan for our lives. Corrie ten Boom was a Dutch Christian who, along with her family, helped over 800 Jews escape death during World War II. When the the German Gestapo would come into neighborhoods and, and look for the Jews that lived in her town. She would gather them in her home and literally hide them away in a, in a crack in her wall where she hid Jews from extermination. It said that she almost single-handedly helped rescue 800 Jews from certain death and execution. And she famously stated this because she knew that by doing this, she puts herself at odds with Nazi Germany and she herself could be arrested and put to death for doing this. But this is what she said. I love this quote. She said, worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. Why don't you think about that for just a moment? Worry doesn't empty tomorrow of its sorrows. It empties today of its strength. When we have fear in our lives, and, we are, and worry is when we just you know, ponder that fear, let it stay and fester, it doesn't take away what's going to happen tomorrow. But it sure takes away our ability to live faithfully today. And if Corrie ten Boom had lived with fear of what the Nazis could do to her, she wouldn't have been faithful today and every day to hide one Jew at a time or six at a time because this all could fit in her crawl space. And, 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 And she wouldn't have saved over 800 lives. If she was worried about what might happen, she wouldn't have lived faithfully today. There's another, there's another scene in her life where she, with a, a bunch of other people, part of the resistance movement, broke into a, <clears throat> broke into a, a, a child care facility and rescued 100 Jewish babies in the middle of the night, knowing that the Nazis were coming the next day. I mean, that's just some gangster stuff. You know what I mean? Like, 
this, this little old lady just, just, we're just going to go in in the middle of the night and do like a Mission Impossible raid and rescue 100 Jewish babies and save them from death. I mean, that's awesome. Would you do that if you were afraid of what would happen to you tomorrow? No. You live far less than what God has. If we allow fear to take root, we don't do what God's calling us to do today. So how do we do this? How do we mitigate the fear in our lives? What's the solution? Because it's, it's prevalent. It's everywhere. How do we, what do we do? What do we do? And what does this text teach us? A few things here. The cure for fear is faith in Jesus. The cure for fear is faith. And it's not just faith in faith. It's not just thinking positively, right? Everyone says, you just got to think positive. You know, put good vibes out. You know what I mean? Like, don't think negatively. That's not what faith is. Biblical faith is faith not in faith. And it's not faith in yourself. It's faith in a person. And his name is Jesus. Can I hear it? Amen. Faith in Jesus is what will help us to mitigate the fear in our lives. Because when Jesus enters the room, as he entered that room where the disciples were locked up, he brings faith. And faith changes the atmosphere. It's the other F word. The more important F word. Amen. Faith. What we need is the F word. We need faith in the midst of our circumstances. I was so tempted when I was talking with some of our pastors to make the title of this message F fear. Okay, anyway, but I thought to myself, you know, we're not that edgy of a church, you know what I mean? I don't want to offend anybody, you know. It was going to be F dot 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 fear, you know, anyway. So that would be a cool thumbnail, you know what I mean, on the YouTube video, but then, you know, somebody would get mad. Anyway, um, faith is the F word we need. In the midst of our fear, we need to faith. We need to bring faith in. It's not, again, faith in ourselves. It's faith in a person. His name is Jesus. And when Jesus enters the room, when Jesus enters into our places of fear, here's what he brings. Four things. Number one, he brings divine peace. I love this. When he entered the room of their fear, what did he say to them? It says, he came and stood among them and he said, peace be with you. When Jesus enters the room, he brings peace. And the peace that Jesus brings, I love what, what, what scripture teaches, is that a peace that surpasses all understanding. In other words, it doesn't make sense why you have peace right now. You should be afraid right now, but you have peace. It doesn't make sense. People look at you and they say, man, you should be afraid of this situation. Why aren't you worried? Why aren't you wringing your hands over what's going on? And we go, I have peace. It's not going to make sense. And they go, well, how can you have peace in the midst of this situation? Because I have Jesus. Because I'm trusting in Jesus, the one who was raised from the dead. The one whom they killed, but whom God brought back to life. That's who I'm trusting in. And I can have peace, even though it makes no sense. The economy is going bad. God's in control. The world may be going to war. I trust in Jesus. Our health may be going down. I still got Jesus. We may be on the verge of physical death. I got Jesus. Peace that makes no sense. Where the world is filled with fear, we can have peace when we have Jesus. He brings peace. And I love this. He says peace to you twice, which means they needed to hear it twice, first of all. But when, in the Bible, whenever something is repeated more than once, it's like an exclamation point. It's like a bold or an underline. So it's emphasizing the fact that Jesus comes to bring peace. In this situation, he's just straight walked into the room, uninvited. You know what I mean? Like they were locked away in fear, and he just walked through the door, walked through the wall, whatever he did, and he proclaimed peace to them. When we let Jesus into the places where we have fear, he brings peace. Can I hear an amen? How many of you have ever experienced peace when you've trusted in Jesus? A peace that made no sense to somebody else? Amen. Hands going up all over this place. Amen. Thank you for testifying together in church. I've had so many situations that it just didn't make sense, but I know I'm going to be okay. I know this is going to work out. And it doesn't always turn out exactly the way that I want, but when I look back on my life, he's always shown up. And it's always ended up better than I thought. That's the peace that we can have when we're in Jesus. And if you're here today and you're saying, I don't have that peace, it just means you need to let Jesus into that room of fear. See, we don't just surrender to Jesus so that we go to heaven. We need to surrender to Jesus in every place of our lives. For example, we need to invite him in to be Lord over our finances. And in that way, we can have peace in our finances. But a lot of people, we do this. I trust you to save me from hell and save me for heaven, but don't tell me how to spend my money. And so we have anxiety in the area of our finances. No, we need to invite Jesus to be Lord of that. Or, or we, we, we don't invite Jesus into the room of our business, the way that we conduct business or work or, or, or whatever. And, 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 and we wonder why we have anxiety and fear there. See, wherever we have fear is an invitation to invite Jesus into that space. 
We need to invite him into our finances, invite him into our relationships, invite him into our marriage, invite him into our parenting, invite him into our fears over health, invite him into our fears over mental health. Whatever area of our lives we're experiencing fear, it's a sign we need to invite Jesus into that space. Because he's... He came uninvited in this moment because the disciples didn't know any better, right? They didn't know that he was even alive, but we know. And he tells us, invite me, invite me into those spaces of fear. Because when he comes, he brings peace. What area of your life are you experiencing fear today? Is there worry? Is there anxiety? I want to encourage you, invite Jesus there. Invite him in. The fact that you have fear doesn't mean that you're a bad person or you're a bad Christian or whatever it is. It's, it's normal. But Jesus is saying, I want to come into that space and bring with you Bring with me my peace. The second thing, and I want to camp here for just a moment, is when he comes, he brings a fresh revelation or a divine revelation of who he is. I love this. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Let me, let me unpack what I think happens here. When he showed them that he was really alive, he wasn't some ghost. Another gospel tells us, he said, I'm hungry. You guys got any food around here? And he ate in front of them. Can you just imagine being in the room that day, watching the resurrected Jesus eat breakfast? I'd have just been like, you know what I mean? Like they awkwardly staring, like, dude, like just watching to see his f- food going to fall through his body because he's a ghost or something. Like, you know, like what's going on? Like, oh my God, you're alive. And you just witness this moment. He really is alive. He's not dead. His body is not dead. It's physical flesh. And he showed them his hands where there was a scar, but it wasn't bleeding. And he showed them the side where he was speared and blood and water gushed out. But yet he was talking to them healthy and alive. And they realized, oh my gosh, the resurrection of the dead happened. He is alive. And it gave them a glimpse into what happens after death. See, because one of the greatest things that we fear, right, is what happens after death. When we're at a funeral and we see that loved one so vibrant and so alive now in that coffin or in that urn. And we, all of us think the same thing. What happens? What, what goes on after life ends? What Jesus just showed them. When you're in faith in Christ, when this life ends, you get a new body. <laughs> You get a brand new body, a resurrected body that can't be killed again, that can't die. Amen. Come on, somebody. Let's give God praise for that. That's what you get. I don't know if you realize it, but there's a resurrected body that is waiting for every one of us if you're in Christ that was purchased by his blood. So when our bodies degrade, I hate to break it to you, our bodies are degrading. I got pains in places I didn't know could hurt anymore, and I'm only in my 40s. That terrifies me, but anyway, that's a whole other story. Uh, but we're gonna get a resurrected body that can't get clogged with cholesterol, you know what I'm saying? That can't have blood sugar spikes and get diabetes. We're gonna get a resurrected body that can't be killed, that can't die when we're in heaven. And when Jesus came back from the dead and showed them, this is what you get. A brand new body, resurrected. And you know what that tells us? It doesn't matter what people do to us this side of heaven. It doesn't matter what happens to us on earth because once this life on earth ends, I get a brand new body that can't die again because it's been resurrected by God himself in heaven. I don't know about you. I'm going to get kind of reckless in heaven. You know what I mean? Because I'm super careful here on earth. I'm going to like drive a motorcycle. You know what I mean? Do some evil Knievel stuff because you know what? It can't die again. I'm joking, of course. Well, maybe not. You know, we'll see what happens when we get there. But But in that moment, they got a fresh revelation of what happens after death. Because a lot of us, we live in fear of that moment. And so were they. They were afraid of the Jews, that the Jews were going to kill them. And when Jesus walked through the wall and showed them a resurrected body, they received faith. That man, if after what they did to you, God can bring you back to life. Man, there's hope. There's vision. There's a life that is yet to come. Therefore, I can live boldly on this earth, not caring about what they do to me in this earth because there's a life that's waiting for me, a body that's waiting for me, resurrected by God. It gave them a vision of the kingdom of God that transcends anything that might happen in this life. Now, this doesn't mean don't take care of your body. You got to steward it, okay? We need to be responsible. The Bible teaches that. But we shouldn't live in fear of what might happen that might limit us from living faithfully today. You follow what I'm saying? And, and, and history shows us that's exactly what happened. The disciples were like, oh my God, we can't die. If we die, we get resurrected. Sweet, let's go out and preach to the very people that murdered Jesus because I'm not afraid anymore because I know what happens on the other side. That's the faith that can come. 
famous uh, Christian theologian by the name of C.S. Lewis said something that I think is profound. He said, if you read history, you'll find out that the Christians who did the most for this present world were precisely those who thought the most of the next, that had a vision for the next world, the next life that gave them hope. Aim at heaven, he said, and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at the earth and you will get neither. What's he talking about? Aim at heaven live with a vision of the eternal life that we have in heaven and you'll live more faithfully for God on this earth but if you only live for the things of this earth you might miss out on both because we're not going to live faithfully for God if it's just for the temporary here and now stuff but if we focus on the resurrection the life that is to come chances are we're going to be a lot more faithful here on earth and inherit eternal life that's why we can be unafraid and bold and faithful even in the face of death in the end of the war in Israel, and it's escalated yesterday. Someone asked me, could this turn into World War III? Is this going to turn into World War III? It was the exact question. I said, I don't know, but it certainly could. It certainly could. And people are, you know, worried. People are full of fear. I mean, we have a lot of military members in our church. Am I going to get deployed? You might. But you know what? In the midst of all of this, we can have faith because we know that this life isn't all that there is. It's not all that there is. And the Bible told us that things are going to get bad and things are going to get worse, but Jesus came. And that's why he died, by the way, to deliver us out of the brokenness of this world for eternal life in heaven. And that's the hope that we can have. This past week, a lot of people thought the world was going to end on Monday. Did you know that? This past Monday with the solar eclipse. A lot of people are like, oh my God, the world's going to end. Jesus is going to come back. So my son came home from school. He's like, dad, did you know this is this total solar eclipse? I'm like, yeah, I knew about that. He's like, is Jesus coming back on Monday? I was like, I don't know. Maybe, you know, I mean. In reality, nobody knows. Jesus said it's not for you to know. And yet people for the last 2,000 years have been trying to figure it out. And with every celestial event, people think that that's the return of Christ. And then he said this, well, I hope so. So I don't have to go to school on Tuesday. That's what he told me. You mean I don't have to go to school? Come on. <laughs> and I was with him. I'm like, yeah, come on, Jesus, let's go. <clears throat> and you know what? We shouldn't fear the end. We shouldn't fear death. We should not look forward to it, but, but when it happens, we know that, hey, man, that's not the end for us. It's just the beginning of the new life, the real life that he's called us to live with him. We don't have to live in fear and terror like the rest of the world. We can live in faith. As I said, every time I go to a funeral, I think about the fact that it's not supposed to be like this. We're not supposed to love people so deeply only to lose them and then see them lying in that box or, or, cre or cremated or whatever. That's not the way that God intended life to be. And you know what? You're right. It's not. God did not design a world for us to die. We're supposed to live forever, but we allowed sin in and sin brings death. And that's why Jesus had to suffer and die so that we could be resurrected after death. And when he walked in that room that day, he showed them exactly what happens on the other side. You get a brand new body. You get a body. You get a body. You, get a, you know what I'm talking about? You do in Christ. And we can live without fear in between. His scars remind us of what he did so that we can receive a resurrected body. All right, we got to move a little faster. Number three, what do we receive when we let Jesus in? A God-given purpose. We receive a God-given purpose. I love this. As the Father has sent me, he said, I am sending you. You know, when we live our lives with purpose, knowing that I'm doing what God's called me to do, it's the safest place to be. You've probably heard that statement before, but the safest place to be is in the middle of God's will for your life. It's the safest place to be. The devil can't take you out if you're in the middle of God's will. And when God says you're done, you're done. But until then, you're, you're, it's the safest place to be is in the center of his will. And that's why one of our purposes here at Pearlside is to help us to discover that purpose and begin to walk in it. Because it's the safest place that we can be. Number four, he gives us the power of the Holy Spirit. What does it say in the text? It says, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins will be forgiven. If you do not, they are not forgiven. He gives us the power of the Holy Spirit, who is with us always. Even when we can't perceive him, he's with us. If you're in Christ, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. And it's his power to overcome. So what do we do? How do we respond? This is all great, Pastor Billy, but what do we do? I want to make this kind of practical for us. Number one, and this is the most important thing. What do we do? Get right with God. Get right with God. Here's what I mean about that. Well, here's what I don't mean. I don't mean stop all your sinning, stop all your smoking, stop all your drinking so that Jesus will love you. That's not the gospel. What I mean by that is get in a right relationship with God. Jesus as Lord of your life so that he can help you to live the life that he's called you to live. We can't do it on our own. 
See, what religion tells us is here's all the things you need to do to get to God. Stop smoking, stop drinking, stop sleeping around, all this stuff. And then maybe God will accept you. That's what religion says. Climb this ladder of works. Here's what the gospel says. Jesus came to our level. He lived the life we should have lived. He accomplished all that stuff. And he came down to our level so that he can lift us out of that place. We don't have to get it right first. We have to receive Jesus in our lives. Get right with him and when we do, he helps us to stop smoking, drinking, sleeping around, and all those things. He helps us to do those things. But we need to get in a right relationship with him. And this means we have to relate rightly to God. And there is something in the Bible that we are supposed to fear. And it's found here in Proverbs 9.10. This is what it says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. We are taught in Scripture that we are supposed to fear God. Well, what does that mean? Because if we don't understand this right, we're going to relate wrongly to him, and that's not going to be good. So what does it mean to fear the Lord? When we think of the fear of the Lord, sometimes we think terror, right? We should be terrified of God. Oh, my God, I'm scared of God, and all this kind of thing. Uh, but in reality, it's not a terror that we're supposed to have in relationship to God, but rather a right relationship. Let me illustrate it with this, with this example. You know, one of the top fears that people have almost every survey is the fear of flying in airplanes. Anyone scared of flying in airplanes? You don't have to raise your hand, but anyway. But it's called aviophobia, the fear of flying in an airplane because you're afraid that you're going to die, right? I mean, that's just the main one. Did you know that chances of dying in a plane crash is 0.00001%? It's a really, really small percentage. Yet I know people that are so afraid of getting on planes that they've never left this island I know people that are so afraid of getting on planes that they live on the mainland. They ride on buses and trains, but, and they'll take two, three days to get somewhere where it takes you like, a, you know, two hours, you know, on a plane. Aviophobia is a real thing. Even though there's only a point zero zero zero, I got to count because I forget, 1% chance of dying in a plane crash. Did you know that chances of dying in a car crash are 33,000 times greater than your chances of dying in a plane crash? Did you know that? 33,000 times greater. So are you saying, Pastor, am I supposed to be afraid of my car? Yeah, kind of, actually. <laughs> but I want to explain this. We're 33,000 times more likely of dying in a car crash, yet most of us never think twice about getting in a car. I mean, even when I fly, I travel kind of a lot for, for you know, ministry stuff, and every time I get on a plane, I'm kind of like, you know, just, just you know, cross every T dot every I. Jesus, I love you. I'm sorry if I did anything. You know what I mean? Especially when there's turbulence. You know what I mean? You just just repent of stuff that you don't even know that you did. You know, I did, I don't know if I did it, but I'm sorry anyway, just in case. You know, right? It's real. But I'd never do that when I get in my car. Get in my car, close the door, go. I don't even think twice, right? Come on, somebody. I remember when I first learned how to drive, I was terrified driving all slow. People honking you, getting all mad at you, right? But after a while, that. Fear kind of goes away. Isn't that true? And Because it's common. You do it every day. And then you go from being terrified on one extreme of driving to so confident that you're eating chicken nuggets and driving with your knee. Come on, somebody. All right? You got the barbecue sauce in one hand because I get this. Don't worry. You know what I mean? It's only keep Papa Gulch. You know? It's like not that bad. You know? And you, 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 we get so careless on the other extreme. So here's what the analogy is for. There is a right way we're supposed to relate to driving. Not terrified neither driving with your knee eating chicken nuggets. There's a middle ground where we treat this machine that could kill you and kill other people with respect. Where we get in reverently, understanding that I could kill someone if I'm not careful. I could kill myself and my children if I'm not careful. I'm gonna treat this thing with respect. And I'm gonna be aware and attentive and I'm gonna follow the rules because I know what could happen. I think that's an analogy of the fear of the Lord. We shouldn't be terrified of God where we stay away from him or we relate to him with fear and trembling. Neither should we be so casual with God that buddy Jesus is cool with anything that I do because he died for me and I'm just going to live carelessly and haphazardly. There's a middle ground where we understand he could destroy me because he's God, but he chooses not to because he's good. And so we relate to him with reverence, with fear but an appropriate level of care. When we read his word, we understand that this is the word of God to me. These aren't suggestions that I can go, eh, yeah, I know it says I should do this, but buddy Jesus, you're cool, right? If I, you know, eh, eh. No, no, no. He is God. He could destroy me because he's God, but he won't because he's good, and I'm going to relate to him in a right, reverent type of way. That's the fear of the Lord. 
He is the God that rained down hot fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. He is the God that sent the plagues to Egypt. He is the God that cracks the earth open and swallows up people that are in rebellion. He's that same God. But because Jesus absorbed the wrath, we don't have to experience that if you're in Christ. He's good. But he is the same God that said, when he comes back to finally judge the earth and everyone in it and all the sin and all for all the sin and all the suffering and all the evil and injustice done, it's going to be done with fire. And everything on this earth is going to be laid waste to fire. And all of us, if you're in Christ, are going to be rescued as though someone escaping through the flames. So we relate to him with that reverence. Not flippantly and casually, buddy Jesus, you're cool with whatever I do. I know I slept around again. I know I did it again, but you're cool, right? Mm, I don't know. You might experience the terror one day. But neither do we ex live with fear, so we stay away. No, we relate to him with reverence, with respect. That's the fear of the Lord. Now, this is important because there are a lot of people that think they know Jesus, but they, they know buddy Jesus. He does want to be your friend, but not your whatever goes, buddy Jesus. He's God. Amen? And if we're going to have a relationship with him that saves us out of the evil of this world, we have to relate to him rightly as God who could destroy us because he's God but doesn't because he's good. And he, and he put the wrath that sin deserves on his son on the cross. I love what Matthew 28 reminds us. Do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, we are to fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. Don't fear those that can only kill you once. Fear the one that can kill you twice. But with reverence and respect. Knowing that he died on the cross. Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we don't have to experience the terror of God ever. I'm not afraid to stand before God, not because I'm a perfect person, but because he's a good God. And through the sacrifice of Jesus, my sins have been washed away. Therefore, my fear is not I'm afraid of you. It's a respect and a gratitude for who he is. That's the fear of the Lord. We need to get right in a right relationship with God. If you're terrified of God, it means you don't have a relationship with him. And you know what? You should be terrified. Because if you don't have a relationship with him, one day wrath will come. But he wants to rescue from that. He wants to save us from that. And if we're too careless with God, it means we've forgotten who he is. We think he's just buddy Jesus. He's just casual, everyday, old, cool Jesus that I'm going to treat, you know, casually. No, no, he's God. And if we're too careless with him, it means we've forgotten who he is. We have to hold those things in tension. Amen. We need to get right in a right relationship with him. And when we do, God's love drives out all fear. Because when we know him, when we really know him, we know he's not someone to be terrified of because of Jesus. We know he loves us. And his love, the Bible says, drives out fear. Look at what 1 John 4, 18 says, one of my favorite passages. It says, there is no fear in love because perfect love drives out fear. Because fear has to do with punishment. And those who fears, the one who fears is not made perfect in love. It means we don't know his love. We don't understand how good he is because we don't really know him. And so we live in terror of him. But when we know him, we know he loves us. And that love drives out all fear. If you're living in fear today, you need to know him. You need to know him deeply and in every area of your life. If you're terrified of God, you need to know him, that he's a good, loving God. And he wants to de demonstrate that to you. If God, I have one of my other favorite verses, and this has helped me so many times when I've been afraid of different circumstances. Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Think about that. If the creator of the universe is on your side, who can be against you? But you know what? That begs the question. Is he on my side? Is he for me? You know how you can know? Is if Jesus is your Lord and Savior. If you're trusting in him and he's your Lord, he is on your side. Amen? It's a good, uh, if, you, if you want to, just a little bonus. Um, my family, we started watching the, there's a, on Netflix, a, this Moses series. Go watch it. It's kind of neat. Because every time God sent the plagues on Egypt, the Israelites were protected because they were on his side. All the animals died in Egypt, but not in Goshen where the Israelites live. It, because they were on his side, right? How do we know we're on God's side is if we trust in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a little bonus. Go watch it. Some stuff I don't agree with, but that's okay. It's still a good illustration. Anyway. And lastly here, God's presence drives out fear. When he's in our lives and we invite him in the room, his presence drives out fear. And I want to close with this. So what do we do? What do we do? Invite Jesus into your places of fear. Like we've been saying all along, we need to invite him in. Invite him in the room. 
Invite them into the place where you're afraid. Invite them into the room where there's anxiety, whatever that is. How do we do that? Philippians 4, 6 through 7 tells us, do not be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about that diagnosis. Don't be anxious about the economy. Don't be anxious about your finances. Don't be anxious about what's going to happen. Don't be anxious about death. But in every single situation by prayer, there it is, with, and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and guard your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation with prayer and petition and thanksgiving. What do we do? We need to invite Jesus in to the places of, of our fear through prayer. We need to pray and invite Jesus into those moments. And I don't know about you, but oftentimes prayer is not my first move. It's my last resort. After I've tried everything in my flesh, I've tried to figure everything out on my own, and now all I can do is pray. Have you ever heard that statement, all we can do now is pray? What do you mean all we can do now is pray? That should be the first thing we do. But oftentimes it's the last thing we do after we've tried everything else. Now all we can do is pray. No, Jesus is in everything. Pray. Invite him in. And there's been so many times where I, I find myself anxious about a situation, worried about a thing, and I realize, you know, I haven't prayed about this. I've been trying to figure it out on my own, you know what I mean, do all this stuff. And then after I can't and I'm stressed, you know, I better pray about this. And I realize, you know what, that's usually what we do. But what would happen if we prayed in the beginning? We invited God in in the beginning, in the big stuff and the small stuff. And we let him begin to do his work and begin to speak to us through it all. We invite Jesus in through prayer. And it's not in your notes, but it is on screen. We also invite Jesus in through the word, through reading the word. Look at what it says here. If faith is the solution, faith in Jesus, where does faith come from? Well, the Bible tells us, Romans 10, 17, faith comes from hearing the word. And hearing through the word of Christ. Faith comes from the word. I remember when I first started coming to church, I'd see people that had so much faith and I'd go, man, I wish I had faith like you. Man, I wish I had faith like the way that you handled that situation. Man, I wish I had faith. And I thought maybe some people are just born with more faith than others. You know what I mean? Like some people are born with a height gene. Hate those people. You know, athletic genes. You know, I'm super jealous of you if that's you. I thought that was what faith was like. Some people are just born with faith. No, the Bible says faith comes to us. And how does it come to us? It comes to us through the word. If we don't have faith, it doesn't mean God doesn't love you. It means we haven't gotten into his word. If we don't have faith in the midst of fear, it means we need to open up the Bible and let the word of God begin to speak to us and, and fill us with faith for whatever that situation is. Maybe we're spending too much time on Facebook and scrolling and getting anxious over all the stuff that's going on in the world and we're just looking at all this stuff rather than putting our faith in his book. And letting it give us faith in the midst of what's going on. I used to read my Bible on my phone because it's just convenient, you know. But I found myself getting way too distracted with a, with a notification here, a notification there. Or it's just too tempting to swipe to something else and go do something else. Come on, somebody. Be honest in church, right? Don't tell me you're reading a lot of the Bible on your phone. I know uh, maybe some of you, but ah, God, I can't do it. So I went back to a paper Bible because I don't get any other notifications on here. <laughs> I'm not tempted to swipe anywhere. If I swipe somewhere else, oh, it's more word, you know? And it helps me to stay focused on what I need to be focused on, the word of God that brings faith. If you're facing, if you're dealing with fear, it's a sign that you need a little bit more of the word or probably a lot more of the word in your life, right? It's an invitation, again, to let the word of God bring faith into your heart. I want to close with this story <clears throat> because all of us are going to deal with this, but the right perspective that comes from God that comes from letting Jesus in the room, that comes from faith, will help us to overcome all the challenges that we may face. One of my greatest fears when I was growing up was always the fear of uh, the day that I knew was coming, which was the day that my grandmother would pass away. I knew that day was coming, right? Every, everyone knows, you know, grandma's not going to live forever kind of thing. And so every time I would go to grandma's house, every time we would leave, I remember I would watch her wave from the balcony and, and go, I would pray. I didn't know God at the time, but I would pray. I don't, I want to see her again. God, keep her alive so that I could see her again. That was actually one of my prayers every single night. I didn't know the Lord really, but I'd pray almost kind of religiously. And I pray that I can, you know, go see grandma again. Cause she took care of me when I was little, you know, she was one of the closest people to me, you know, and uh, thankfully she knew the Lord and, 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 and she actually would read the Bible to me and tell me Bible stories. And I'd be like, grandma, I'm trying to play video games. Leave me alone, you know? Um, but it put some faith in me. It did. Well, I remember when I got the call, my mom called me and said, you need to come to the hospital because we think it's time. And 
Something you need to know about my grandmother. She had different medical challenges, and she was in the hospital and, and in care homes for about 10 years. And so I watched her slowly deteriorate over time, and it was hard. But I'm in college now, and my, my mom calls me, tells me, you know, you need to come to the hospital because it's, it's time. And I, I went, and it was the day that I dreaded because I was knowing that this was coming for a long time. Got to the hospital, parked the car, walked into the room, and it was, it was tough. She was there hooked up to life support and all that, and I got to pray with her, and I thanked her for sharing the faith with me, even though I didn't listen when I was a kid. And uh, I prayed with her, and I said goodbye. Thankfully, I had enough of the word in me to know where she was going. Thankfully, I had enough word in me to not be filled with utter sorrow, but still the Hanabara was coming out. I was crying. It was, it was bad. And when they unhooked the life support machines and she went to be with Jesus, it was really hard. But I knew. She knew the Lord. I knew where she was going to be. So now I'm walking back to my car. I still remember it like it was yesterday, walking across, you know, the parking lot to where my car was. And the Lord gave me a vision. I never have these. This was the first time really. And I don't know if it was a real vision or just in my imagination, whatever. But I saw my grandmother in heaven. And I saw her walking through the streets. And she's been bedridden for a decade. But I saw her walking through the streets of heaven. And she wasn't old she was young and skinny, and I didn't yet have a, a theology that you get a new body. I didn't know this yet, but I saw her walking, and she was young, and she was, she was, she was you know, she wasn't crippled anymore, and she was hugging on people that she, you know, that, and I didn't know who these people were, and she was happy, and I, and I got happy. Still tears coming down my eyes, all puffy and swollen, but I remember this big smile came on my face as I was walking to my car, and I was like, man, she's alive. She's happy and joyful and living and, and man, she's in heaven with those that have gone before her and man, she's alive and man, I got to go to work tomorrow <laughs> and I got a little depressed thinking about the fact that I got to go to work tomorrow and I thought to myself, I want to be where she is, but I might live another 60 years or so. Dang, that's a long time. I can't wait to be with her again and I was filled with joy with that revelation and can I encourage you with something? When we have faith and we understand what the Bible teaches, even in the face of death, we can have faith rather than fear. Even in the face of loss, because this is not all that there is. This is just the beginning. We're just passing through this life. And if the resurrection of Jesus really happened, as we believe, then he proved it. He proved it. Look at the holes in my hands. Look at the hole in my side. I'm not dead. And like me, you too will live if you trust in me. You don't have to fear of what man might do to you. You don't have to fear of what will happen this side of heaven because I've already purchased a new life for you on the other side of this. Live faithfully. Live boldly, knowing that I am with you. And one day I will bring you home and we'll be all reunited together one day. That's the hope that we should have and which charge us to live boldly on this earth for as many more days that we may have. Amen. Let's pray together as we close. Father, we thank you for your word that reminds us of these spiritual realities, that helps us in the places where we have fear, to trust in you, to look to you who died and rose again as an example, the first fruits, as scripture said, of all that is to come for the rest of us. So God, we trust in you. Thank you for this reminder today so that we, live, we can live with faith in the face of fear, boldly in this life for you, and for others. We pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen and amen.